Artemis Millet was called by revelation to build the Kirtland Temple. In 1833, he came from Canada to Kirtland and took over superintending the work on the Lord's house, consecrating at the same time $1,000 of his own money in the process. During the course of construction on the temple, Artemis became ill with the dread and often deadly disease of cholera. He called for the elders to come and bless him, but the blessing had no effect. Artemis later recorded, I suffered such excruciating pain that my groaning was heard at Joseph Smith's house, a distance of 250 yards. I was afterwards told that when in agony I called out, let Joseph Smith come and lay his hands on me, and I shall be healed, and I know it, not knowing what I said. Joseph pressed his way through the crowd, for the house was filled with people, and came forward, and laying his hands upon my head, asked God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ to heal me. The vomiting and purging ceased, and I began to amend from that very moment. Coming up next, a History of the Saints special presentation. Joseph Smith the Prophet, Testimonies of Those Who Knew Him. Was Joseph Smith a prophet of God or a liar and a fraud? Like a giant boulder splitting the stream of humanity, Joseph Smith stands immovably before the world making a bold declaration that the gospel of Jesus Christ was restored in its fullness through him. And now all must decide for themselves if he was telling the truth. When God wants to prove anything, he calls witnesses who have seen, heard, and know. Those witnesses are then accountable to share what they know and all of us stand accountable for what they declare. Witnesses are not to be taken lightly. What follows now are the accounts drawn from the journals and family records of those who witnessed for themselves that Joseph Smith was a prophet and so declared it. Zebedee Coltrane was seeking the truth when he first heard the gospel preached in 1831. He was baptized January 21st, 1831, through a hole in the ice in a river in Ohio. Shortly after, he became a missionary. It was in 1834 that Zebedee was just returning to Kirtland from a mission to Canada when he met the prophet Joseph Smith, who asked Zebedee, to accompany him to a conference in New Portage, Ohio. Well, of course, Zebedee went and recorded the following. Joseph seemed to have a far off look in his eyes or was looking at a distance. And presently he, Joseph, stepped between brothers Cowdery and me and taking us by the arm said, let's take a walk. We went to a place where there was some beautiful grass and grapevines and swamp beach interlaced. President Joseph Smith then said, let us pray. We all three prayed in turn, Joseph, Oliver, and me. Brother Joseph then said, now brethren, we will see some visions. Joseph lay down on the ground on his back and stretched out his arms, and we lay on them. The heavens gradually opened, and we saw a golden throne on a circular foundation, something like a lighthouse. And on the throne were two aged personages, having white hair and clothed in white garments. They were the two most beautiful and perfect specimens of mankind we ever saw. Joseph said, they are our first parents, Adam and Eve. Adam was a large, broad-shouldered man, and Eve as a woman was as large in proportion. It was early September, 1830, when the prophet Joseph Smith and his wife, Emma, moved from Harmony, Pennsylvania to Fayette, New York, to live once again with the Peter Whitmer family. Upon arrival, Joseph was troubled when he discovered that Hiram Page, a son-in-law of the Whitmers, had in his possession a certain stone by which he had obtained to certain revelations, all of which 
were entirely at variance with the order of God's house as laid down in the New Testament, end of quote. Joseph labored with the brethren and at Oliver Cowdery's urging inquired of the Lord and received a revelation now known as Doctrine and Covenants section 28. On September 26, 1830, the conference of the church convened at the Whitmer home in Fayette. The matter of Hiram Page and his revelations was discussed and put to rest. The conference voted to sustain the revelation, section 28, that declared Joseph was the one appointed of the Lord to receive commandments and revelations for the entire church and the only one. Newell Knight was there. He attended that conference and in the days before and gave the following remarkable witness of those events. On my arrival, I found Brother Joseph in great distress of mind on account of Hiram Page, who had managed to get up some dissension of feeling among the brethren by giving revelation concerning the government of the church and other matters which he claimed to have received through the medium of a stone he possessed. He had quite a roll of papers full of these revelations, and many in the church were led astray by them. Even Oliver Cowdery and the Whitmer family had given heed to them, although they were in contradiction to the New Testament and the revelations of these last days. Joseph was perplexed and scarcely knew how to meet this new exigency. That night I occupied the same room that he did, and the greater part of the night was spent in prayer and supplication. After much labor with these brethren, they were convinced of their error and confessed the same, renouncing the revelations as not being of God, but acknowledging that Satan had conspired to overthrow their belief in the true plan of salvation. During this time, we had much of the power of God manifested among us, and it was wonderful to witness the wisdom Joseph displayed on this occasion, for truly God gave unto him great wisdom and power, and it seems to me that none who saw him administer righteousness under such trying circumstances could doubt that the Lord was with him. He acted not with the wisdom of man, but with the wisdom of God. The Holy Ghost came upon us and filled our hearts with unspeakable joy. Alexander Nybar was born in 1808 in France to Nathan and Rebecca Nybar. His parents were educated Jews. Though his father wanted him to become a rabbi, Alexander attended the University of Berlin and became instead a surgeon and a dentist. After graduation, he traveled and in time settled in Preston, England, where he married and then February 7th, 1841, joined the church. The Nybars then sailed from Liverpool on the ship Sheffield to Nauvoo. Upon their arrival, Alexander was ordained to the priesthood and to the office of a 70. Quote, he was honored with the friendship of the prophet Joseph, end of quote. Now, in his journal dated May 24th, 1844, Alexander recorded the following. May 24. Called at Brother Joseph Smith's and met Mr. Bonney. Brother Joseph told us of the first call he had at a revival meeting. His mother and brother and sister got religion. He wanted to get religion too. Wanted to feel and shout like the rest, but could feel nothing. He opened his Bible. The first passage that struck him was, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Joseph went into the woods to pray, knelt himself down. His tongue was cleaved to the roof of his mouth, could utter not a word. He felt easier after a while. He saw a fire towards heaven. It came near and nearer. He saw a personage in the fire who had a light complexion, blue eyes, a piece of white cloth ran over his shoulders, his right arm bare. After a while, 
Another person came to the side of the first. Mr. Smith then asked, Must I join the Methodist Church? No, they are not my people. They all have gone astray. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. But this is my beloved son. Hearken ye to him. The fire drew nearer and rested upon the trees. It enveloped him and comforted him. He endeavored to rise, but felt uncommon feeble. He got into the house. He told the Methodist priest, who said this was not an age for God to reveal himself in vision. He said revelation had ceased with the New Testament. William Carroll McClellan came with his family to Nauvoo in 1841. In 1916, near the end of his life, William was asked by his grandson, quote, what was the one thing that stood out in his life more than anything else that gave him an absolute testimony of the gospel and the authenticity of the calling of the prophet Joseph? This is what William said. When I was a boy and working in the fields with my father, we were hoeing corn in the late afternoon. It was quite warm and we were about to quit for the day when Father straightened up and looked around and then looked at me. The solemn stillness of the surrounding area was almost frightening. The leaves on the corn suddenly drooped as if they had been in a blast of extreme heat. The leaves on the tree wilted and hung as if in deepest sorrow. Father looked at me and said, Will, something has happened to the prophet. As soon as the man from the surrounding country could be notified from Carthage, we were told that at that identical time of which I spoke, the prophet had been killed. That was proof enough to me. If the leaves of the trees and on the corn could be near enough to the prophet to mourn the passing of his spirit, I could not ask for anything more faith-promoting. Oliver Cowdery, was granted extraordinary gifts and opportunities by the Almighty. He stood with the prophet Joseph Smith as the co-regent of this last dispensation, and yet, for reasons known in full only to him, Oliver became disaffected and withdrew from the church in 1838. And yet, through all the time Oliver was out of the church, he zealously protected his reputation as a witness and maintained close relationships with friends in the church. As time passed, Oliver's anger cooled and his heart softened. Finally, October 1848, Oliver and his family rode into a clearing near Canesville, Iowa in the middle of a church conference. Orson Hyde recognized him and brought him to the stand and invited him to speak. With great emotion, Oliver took the pulpit and according to witnesses, shared the following testimony. Friends and brethren, my name is Cowdery, Oliver Cowdery. In the early history of this church, I stood identified with her and one in her councils. I wrote with my own pen the entire Book of Mormon, save a few pages, as it fell from the lips of the prophet Joseph Smith, as he translated it by the gift and power of God, by means of the Urim and Thummim, or as it is also called by that book, Holy Interpreters. I beheld with my eyes and handled with my hands the gold plates from which it was transcribed. I also saw with my eyes and handled with my hands the Holy Interpreters, that book is true. Sidney Rigna did not write it. Mr. Spaulding did not write it. I wrote it myself as it fell from the lips of the prophet. Brother Hyde has just said that it is very important that we keep and walk in the true channel in order to avoid the sandbars. This is true. The channel is here. The holy priesthood is here. I was present with Joseph when the higher or Melchizedek priesthood was conferred by the holy angel from on high.
On February the 4th, 1879, Joseph Smith III, the president of the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as it was called then, paid a visit to his mother, Emma Smith Bitterman, at her home in Nauvoo, Illinois. Joseph was troubled. There were questions that he had to ask his mother about his murdered father while he still had time. Accordingly, Joseph wrote down a series of questions to ask his mother. These are some of those questions and her response. We begin with questions regarding the Book of Mormon. Question, could not Father have dictated the Book of Mormon to you, Oliver Cowdery and the others who wrote for him, after having first written it or having first read it out of some book? Answer, Joseph Smith could neither write nor dictate a coherent and well-worded letter let alone dictate a book like the Book of Mormon. And though I was an active participant in the scenes that transpired and was present during the translation of the plates and had cognizance of things as they transpired, it is marvelous to me, a marvel and a wonder, as much so as to anyone else. Question, Mother, what is your belief about the authenticity or origin of the Book of Mormon? Answer. My belief is that the Book of Mormon is of divine authenticity. I have not the slightest doubt of it. I am satisfied that no man could have dictated the writing of the manuscript unless he was inspired. For when acting as his scribe, your father would dictate to me hour after hour, and when returning after meals or after interruptions, he could at once begin where he had left off without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. This was a usual thing for him to do. It would have been improbable that a learned man could do this, and for one so ignorant and unlearned as he was, it was simply impossible. Question, what of the truth of Mormonism? Answer, I know Mormonism to be the truth and believe the church to have been established by divine direction. I have complete faith in it. Emma Smith Bitterman passed away just two months later. This testimony was subsequently published by the Reorganized Church, October the 1st, 1879, in the Saints Herald in Plano, Illinois. Not only does this stand on record as her final witness, but it is a compelling testimony from that very one who knew Joseph Smith better than any other. In September, 1842, Joseph Smith was in hiding in the city of Nauvoo. The state of Missouri was trying to kidnap him and take him back across the Mississippi River. Joseph knew if he crossed the river, he would never return. For three months, he was cut off from friends, family, and the happy routines of daily life. It was normal for him. President Brigham Young once described the prophet's life this way. He said, if a thousand hounds were on this temple block, let loose on one rabbit, it would not be a bad illustration of the situation at times of the prophet. He was hunted unremittingly. It was in the midst of this unrelenting persecution that Joseph dictated these inspired words. Quote, Brethren, shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward and not backward. Courage, brethren, and on, on to the victory. Let your hearts rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Let the earth break forth into singing. Let the dead speak forth anthems of eternal praise to the King Emmanuel, end of quote. It is significant 
Not only what Joseph said there, but when and where he said it. For you see, Joseph dictated those words September the 7th, 1842, while he was in hiding and confined in the dark, cramped attic of the home of Edward Hunter. I'm Glenn Rossi. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.